Okay, so we're going to talk about storage tube displays or how you get 4K resolution in the mid 70s. You might have thought 4K was a new thing, but actually all new things are old things waiting to be born again. So before we talk about storage tubes, we have to talk briefly about something called the Williams tube. And at MIT, when they were researching uh, efficient memory architectures for a vacuum tube computer, the predecessor to the Whirlwind computer, which itself was the predecessor to the Sage computers at the, uh, running Air Defense Network, uh, there was something called the Williams tube. And what the Williams tube was, was a way of storing bits onto a CRT as a, a grid of charge wells. And you can see on the right here is a representation of what you would see on the tube itself if you were looking at it while it was storing bits. And the idea is, is exploiting a secondary effect of a CRT display that if you shoot an electron beam at a CRT display with enough energy, you create a, a charge well by ejecting electrons from the phosphor coating on the inside of the CRT. So using a um, complex set of arrangements that preserves the charge well that you've created and addressing portions of the screen by deflecting the electron beam in X and Y, you can create a 2D grid of storage cells. And that was an early form of memory that they looked at before they settled on core memory, which you may be familiar with. But the interesting part we're inter the part we're interested in is the fact that this enabled people to recognize that they could store patterns onto a CRT. And from this earlier picture, you can see that whether you have a bit stored or not, it changes the intensity of the light that's being emitted by the phosphor. So um, an appealing part of uh, a CRT is that, you know, by using the electron beam, deflecting it with either a magnet or an electrostatic charge, you can address an XY area on the screen. And uh, for a Williams tube, they can typically store like, you know, 2,560 bits, you know, so it's not very much storage on a Williams tube. The tube itself is not particularly large. Um, and like uh, core memory, reading a Williams tube is a destructive operation. So every time you read a bit off of the Williams tube, you have to then go back and write it again. Uh, because reading the uh, chart, detecting whether a charge well is present or not is a destructive operation. So if you read it, then you have to recreate the charge well that represented the stored bit. Uh, and a charge well also has to be constantly energized. If you, if you drop power, then all the memory is lost. So it's a volatile memory, it's not non-volatile. Unlike core memory, where core memory, if the power is lost, the magnetization of the individual cores remains. Now, after the Williams tube, Tektronics created something called the storage tube and they introduced this into an oscilloscope product. And the idea here was that if you had, say, a transient electrical signal, that you could capture it onto the storage tube and then you could examine the signal visually for as long as you wanted because it's stored on the tube. You didn't have to worry about reproducing that transient over and over and over again for you to analyze it. Tektronics was a test and measurement device company. Um, the direct view storage tube that they created uh, was a great assistant, was of great assistance in visualizing waveforms, both uh, periodic waveforms that, or um, as I said, transient waveforms that you wanted to study for a periodic waveform that had the occasional glitch in it, you could keep writing into the display over and over, over again. And if it's a regular waveform that was synchronized uh, on the triggering edge of the waveform, then the repeating waveform is just going to keep overwriting the same area over and over again. And then when your uh, glitch comes in, it's going to stick out from the repeating signal. So though, this was a good way to 
analyze these transients and glitches, which are the hardest thing to debug in electronics. The, the regular waveforms, they're, they're easy to uh, visualize and see that they're working correctly, but if you have these glitches or transients coming in, you need to study them more carefully and try to figure out what's causing those, because they usually represent problems in your design. Now, a typical uh, dynamic refresh display oscilloscope you have to keep refreshing the display with new signal data. But in a storage scope, once the signal is uh, recorded onto the face of the tube, and as long as power remains applied to the tube, it, 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 they have to maintain a, a voltage field in order for the um, phosphorus to continue emitting and for the image to can remain to be stored. But as long as that power is applied, then the image is gonna be retained on the screen. So. It's a good way to create a static image that you can look at for a long time. You don't have to keep actively refreshing it. The storage time is about an hour, um, and the erase time for these displays is about a, a quarter of a, of a second. Now, due to the nature of the technology, you can't selectively erase a portion of the screen. You can only erase the entire screen. And this is because the erase operation basically applies a big voltage blast to the whole screen, and that resets all of the charge wells that were being used to store information, or in this case, a picture. Um, but not having active refresh simplifies the display circuitry because it means you don't have to keep driving a new image onto the display for it to be, uh, you know, to keep driving a new image onto the tube for it to be displayed. So once the image has been written, it's kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch once the image has been written, it stays there until it's erased. Now, um, the driving circuitry is similar to a pen plotter. It's an XY uh, voltage arrangement. So you apply a voltage to deflect the electron beam in the X direction, or another voltage to deflect the electron beam in the Y direction. And as you move the beam across the display, it draws. If uh, you need to draw disjointed segments or you know lines that are not connected, then you can move the beam without drawing by um, reducing the amount of current that's applied to the electron beam. So you're, you're still, the beam is still there and you're deflecting it, but it's not powerful enough to write into the display surface. So unlike uh, the typical display you have now, almost every display now is a raster display where it is um, a fixed grid in X and Y, that's your display resolution, number of pixels per line and number of lines per screen. Unlike those kinds of displays, uh, a storage tube is a so-called vector display. It's more like driving an XY uh, plotter where you specify the, the two endpoints and the electron beam is literally sweeping between the two endpoints and drawing a line that way. So. Tektronix had the storage tube that they integrated into their oscilloscope, and they found that a lot of customers were just driving the oscilloscope to basically use it as a display. They weren't actually using it as an oscilloscope. So all the extra circuitry for oscilloscope triggering and waveform uh, analysis and stuff wasn't being used. So Tektronix said, hey, we can just make it a product that's the display and not you know, omit all the oscilloscope circuitry. And that was the uh, 601 storage display they introduced in 1968. Um, the 601 was incorporated into a variety of graphics products from many computer manufacturers such as DEC. Um, there's also um, a project at MIT called the Advanced Remote Display Station or ARDS. There's a, a simulators out for that. Uh, and that also used the storage tube display as a graphics uh, output device. And so they're, what they're doing in a situation like that is they've got digital to analog converters that are creating the necessary voltages to the drive the display in order to write vectors onto the display surface and a signal to erase the screen. And then that's put into some kind of software library that is then used to draw pictures. So after the Tektronix came out with their storage tube display product, they noticed like, hey, a lot of people are doing graphics with this, but in a time-sharing environment, you're often sitting at a terminal that's remote from 
the computer that you're using. The computer that you're using is in some, you know, climate controlled machine room and it's noisy and it's not a, a particularly good place to work because it's cold, it's loud. So they came up with the Tektronix 4002. That's their first terminal product. And it basically is uh, a little card cage with a bunch of cards that plug into a bus and that sits underneath the storage tube to display. And you can see that it, it, it's really not even integrated as a single product yet. You can kind of cl clearly see that really they just kind of bolted the display product on top of a box that talks to the computer over a serial line and has a keyboard and interface electronics for the keyboard and the serial communication and some kind of um, driver circuitry to drive the display. So you've got the storage tube, the interface electronics, and they created, uh, by having this little card cage, they can plug in different cards for different interfaces. Not everybody was using uh, RS-232. 69 RS-232 had kind of barely been standardized yet. So a lot of people are using a teletype style interface, which is a current loop interface. Um, you, if you were connected to your own custom computer, you might have been using a parallel bus interface. So depending on which cards you plugged into that little card cage would determine what kind of interface you would get to the host computer. Um, this, is, this is 1969, so it's small scale integration parts, not very uh, you know, dense components, it's chips that have like you know, four AND gates on them or something like that. And because of the form factor they chose for their card cage, it has a very high uh, board count. It's not particularly cheap to manufacture because you have to manufacture all these boards. You've got all the interconnect components and everything to connect all the boards together. So it makes for an expensive product. Their next generation was the 4010. And this is a, uh, a complete terminal is built into a little pedestal. And you've got a storage tube integrated into the terminal. You've got uh, control switches to control things like whether your terminal is online or offline. Uh, things uh, like uh, half duplex or full duplex, you know, various uh, communications controls. You've got the standard keyboard layout. It's uppercase only, so um, a lot of terminals in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, they hadn't yet quite embraced the idea of lowercase. A lot of software and various computers were built around the idea of talking to a teletype, which was uppercase only, so that continued over into computer terminals for a while. One interesting addition of the 4010 compared to previous products is that there's a couple of thumb wheels on the side of the um, terminal, and these can be used as a graphical input device. It ends up drawing a, what they call a crosshair cursor, so uh, they would drive an electron beam bright and uh, hard enough to be visible but not uh, with enough power to actually store into the display and by moving the XY knobs you could position the crosshair left and right and up and down and use that to provide graphical input in from the from the terminal so this opens up the possibility of CAD applications because you've got graphical output and you've got graphical input. So now I don't need a separate digitizing tablet in order to enter XY grid data or to draw out shapes. I can use the crosshair cursor. It's not as convenient as a mouse, but uh, it is available. Um, underneath, the ped is, underneath the top part is where the uh, storage tube is located. The sto that part of the terminal has the display driver circuitry but it doesn't have the computer interface circuitry. And that's located in a card cage underneath uh, the storage tube. Now, it, a storage tube is interesting that it has a flat display surface, unlike um, a CRT you know, that we are used to today, where they, have, you know, they almost always have a curved surface at the front. And I think that's mainly because, unlike drawing a, uh, a raster grid, when you're drawing these vector operations, the uh, fact that y when you're driving the electron beam, it might have a slight amount of distortion on it, it, it due to the way that they created the driving circuitry, it, it doesn't result in any distortion, even though the front of the, the face of the screen is flat. 
Uh, the resolution is pretty high. It's 782 by, or 780 by 1024. Um, the circuitry actually drives 10 bits in both directions, but uh, due to the, the geometry of the screen, um, you don't get a full 124 positions visible in the vertical direction. Um, typically the host interface is RS-232, but again, the interface is just a communications card that plugs into that card cage in the pedestal, so it could be easily switched out to be a current loop or some kind of custom parallel interface if you had a custom interface circuitry. Um, it, they had, if you're familiar with programming terminals, getting them to do more interesting things than just display text. You typically refer to these as escape sequences. The 4010 did have rudimentary escape sequence processing, but there is no microprocessor in this terminal. So all the escape sequence processing, the special instructions that tell it how to draw graphics, how to draw points, how to draw te text you could just send, it would, it would uh, show up as a dot matrix grid of points for every character. But if you want to draw graphics, you need to send special escape sequences. Those escape sequences are all handled by uh, custom circuitry that just recognizes that a, a character on the input stream has appeared that represents the beginning of a command. And then it kind of goes into a state machine that starts processing command sequences. And um, all the XY information that communicates the points or endpoints of lines is all transmitted through printable characters, but they're encoded in such a way that several characters are needed to represent a full X location or a full Y location. So uh, there was also a hard copy interface, which is kind of interesting in that uh, the hard copy interface, really what it does is it has a sense amplifier in the terminal, and then the printer that attaches to the terminal literally drives a uh, an XY scan of the entire display and reads out the contents of uh, what is stored there by recognizing the different voltage levels and then it prints that out as basically a monochrome printout of what's on your screen. But being able to get a hard copy of your graphic output without having to send it to a different device, that was another big advantage. So coming out as it did in 1972, this 4010 terminal opened up a huge range of possibilities for graphical applications, especially in a time-sharing environment, because the nature of the storage tube means uh, I may have a slow communication channel between my terminal and the host computer. 300 baud was very common. So getting a graphical picture sent down at 300 baud would take a while, but once it's on the screen, I can look at it for as long as I want. I don't need to have the host computer send more data to refresh that image. Having graphical input meant that not only could I see a graphical uh, representation of whatever my design was, if it's an electrical CAD design or a mechanical CAD design or even uh, some kind of mapping application, I can use those thumb wheels to interact with the software and indicate I want, uh, here's a region of interest that I want to zoom in on, or here's uh, a new location where I want you to start drawing a new line, and I want to draw a line from this location to this location so I can create graphical input and I can interact graphically with some piece of software. And again, this can all be done over a low bandwidth communication line. You might have to have a little bit of patience to draw a complex image, but at least once it's drawn, you can look at it for as long as the storage tube is going to retain that, which is about an hour. So that's, that's plenty of time to figure out what's going on with the image without having to refresh it. Um, the popularity of this device was such that Tektronix created a Fortran library called Plot10. It was called Plot10 because it's the Tektronix 4010. So they had a high level programming API to alleviate you from having to figure out how to write the proper escape codes to draw XY points or specify XY locations or decode the input of the, th or of the thumb wheels if you'd requested a, a positional input from the user. So that elevated up uh, the task of writing a graphical application to just using this uh, subroutine library in Fortran. And Fortran would have been the most common lang commonly used language for these kinds of scientific-oriented or graphical-oriented applications at that time. Um, 
Again, downside of a storage tube, no selective erase, which means I can't, if I want to erase something, I have to erase the entire thing and then redraw from scratch. So one of the ways that people compensated with this was they just kept, as you modified the graphic image that you were editing on screen, it just kept drawing the new parts that changed. And when it got too cluttered, and you couldn't understand what was going on anymore, then you'd send a request back to the application, say like, all right, clear the screen and redraw everything from scratch again. But uh, because that's an expensive operation over a slow communication channel, most people just tolerated the clutter until they couldn't stand it anymore or couldn't, couldn't see what was going on and make sense of the screen. And then they would issue a, a request to redraw the entire image. Um, it's also monochrome, it's all green. So that's all you're ever going to see. You can't, it's not even grayscale. So you don't, you don't get different intensities of green. You just have one, it's just on or off. But for 70s CAD and early 80s CAD, that's perfectly fine. I, you, you know, if you're drawing a schematic diagram, you just need to see the symbols on the screen and how they're connected. You don't care what color they're in. Or if it's even a floor plan in an architectural application. What you're interested in is the dimensions of the elements in the diagram and their position. You're not, you're not concerned so much about color. So although it's monochrome, given that it enabled a bunch of these kinds of CAD and design applications for the first time, having it in one color was perfectly acceptable. Uh, the big drawback was the long redraw time of complex uh, diagrams and illustrations. Also, the screen's not particularly large. It's only nine inch diagonal, and it's also not particularly bright. So people typically used uh, these terminals in a darkened room, or they, uh, Tektronix also sold a little metallic hood that you could attach to the front of the screen, and that would block the glare of overhead fluorescent lights if somebody, if you're working in an environment where you can't turn the lights off, you put this little hood on there, and that would uh, cut down on the glare and let you see the screen better. Um, now, building on the success of the 4010, they came out with a successor model called the 4014. This is a larger display, and now because the display is larger, you might notice in this picture that it actually has a rounded front. It's not completely flat anymore. The cabin, it's a little larger, but it's still fundamentally the same device. The only reason things are larger is just because the tube is larger. Um, and again, we have a bunch of controls at the top that are used for controlling things like, you know, whether the terminal's online or offline, half duplex, full duplex, so on. Um, there are the thumb wheel controls for uh, providing graphical input again. You've got your uh, keyboard. However, this is not a keyboard in, with a modern key layout. So you might notice things like the square brackets and the curly braces are like, you know, in funky positions. And that's because languages that people programmed at the time were more typically Fortran or Assembler. And in Assembler and Fortran, the main thing you want is parentheses, not square brackets and curly braces. Um, square brackets and curly braces became more commonly used when people adopted C or Pascal. Those languages came later uh, in terms of common use. Uh, but the markets that Tektronix was selling into were primarily scientific and engineering, engineering oriented. So Fortran was ruling the day. And in Fortran, array indices and so on are used with uh, parentheses. So these oddly, you know, rarely used characters like, you know, backtick are positioned off on the on the edges of the keyboard and in a non-standard keyboard layout. Uh, the other thing is it is still uppercase only on the original 4014. Uh, there was a later um, variant that had upper and lower case. Um, and you notice some of the keys are labeled like rub out and things like that. So rub out is what they would call delete now. Uh, the, some of the names of these characters um, are using uh, a terminology that kind of more oriented from teletype era. There's also um, the, uh, in the, in the 4014 it's reset, in the uh, 4010 the key is labeled page, but this is the key that erases the entire screen. 
um, there's also a caps lock key, but it's called TTY lock because if you wanted to lock the terminal into all uppercase, it's because you're using an environment that is expecting a teletype, so a TTY. Uh, I mentioned rub out is really delete, and uh, if you haven't used serial terminals much, you might be not familiar with the break key. Uh, the break key in a asynchronous communications environment provides a signaling level to interrupt any communication that's going on and let the host computer know that you're intending to break communication. Sometimes that is also used in environments where because they have uh, an expensive long distance line between the, where the terminals are and where the computer is, you might be sharing that communications line with, a, with several terminals on the uh, user side and the break key can be used to, to kind of signal and, and switch between uh, different terminals to indicate your, your session is over and now you can release the line to, to another terminal. In a modern environment, like nobody really has any use for the, the break signaling anymore. And uh, if you're using a um, actual serial port and a you know terminal emulation software, there might be a menu option to send a break, but many times even it's omitted from uh, terminal software. So the 4014 has a 19 inch screen, so it's a it's a much it's double the dimension of the 9 inch screen that was in the 4010, so it's a much larger display. And because it's physically larger, using the same driving circuitry, we can address 4K resolution by uh, 3120. So this was a big advance. Uh, I mean, this is 1974, so we're getting 4K resolution. This means now I can have larger, more complicated diagrams on screen and still make sense of them. So although uh, you notice they always refer to their resolution as the number of addressable points, but because it's an electron beam writing on a display like an Etch-a-Sketch, if you tried to draw uh, vertical lines alternating every other address, the width of the um, image that is drawn on the phosphor is such that even though technically there's an address separating these two vertical lines, they're going to bleed into each other. And, and so it's addressable, but it's not really the same as the visible resolution that you get from the display itself. So th that normally isn't a problem in the kinds of diagrams we're talking about here. We're talking about vector CAD oriented diagrams. You're not going to be drawing a bunch of vertical lines every other address. It, um, it's not the kind of thing that you would typically do. Although there was a, um, there is an extension uh, for the 4014, an, an, app, an optional add-on that gave you a, 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 a way to draw a point with grayscale. And using that option, you could draw a grayscale image onto the screen. Um, there's a good uh, 4010, 4014 emulator project out there on GitHub that emulates this. And it can get that uh, grayscale look on the screen. The way that they get a grayscale uh, operation to work on the actual terminal is they defocus the electron beam so that it actually spreads out. The, the, the spot size is what they call it, uh, is the physical dimension that appears on the screen when you write with the electron beam. And by defocusing the beam, they can get the spot size to be larger. And that means that the um, intensity drawn at that location is less because the, the same number of electrons are spread out over a larger distance. Uh, it, so the 4014, as I mentioned, does have lowercase support. Uh, it has a limited form of dynamic rendering, and what this means is that you can um, repeatedly send a short vector list to the terminal. It will draw it at lower intensity, so it's still visible, but it's not strong enough to actually store into the tube. And this means you can do what's called a rubber banding operation, where you, you select a starting point with the crosshair, cursor and then as you move the crosshair cursor to the next position it'll draw a light rubber band but from your original point to the point that you're selecting now so that you can get a graphical feedback of the graphical elements that you're entering into an application. That's typically what the limited dynamic rendering was used for. Another uh, option was 
or another application rather of the dynamic rendering was you could draw a static display that was a background and then you could have some small portion of vector graphics that was dynamic on top of that. Um, they had optional peripherals for this that could attach directly to the terminal. So previously with the 4010, if you had a pen plotter that you wanted to use for hard copy output, you would have to have that pen plotter connected to the host computer through some other mechanism. It couldn't be attached directly to the terminal. And you, you know, what people typically did is they had a little switcher. You'd have one switch position that was set to the terminal, another switch position was set to the plotter. You'd be using the terminal with some piece of software. You'd say, now I want to do a plot. And you would give that command to the software. The software waits for you to switch it over to the plotter. And then the software sends the instructions to the plotter to redraw the same graphical image on the plotter. With the 4014, there was a so-called three PPI interface. This is the three peripheral uh, interface that allows you to attach up the three peripherals to directly to the terminal. And then the terminal could do the switching for you uh, on a command received from the host computer. So that would be a pen plotter. Uh, it could be, um, a, they had a little a tape recorder that basically would allow you to send the graphical image down and record it on tape. And then you could play it back locally to redraw that image from the tape. You wouldn't have to wait for transmission again from the host. There was a joystick interface that allowed you to uh, have a joystick for 2D input instead of the thumb wheels. Um, there was a digitizing tablet, again, that would let you um, enter uh, graphical input by using a pen and um, a tablet. So if you are taking an existing um, drawing that you're reproducing in the computer, you could tape that drawing down to the tablet and then you could digitize it in by you know, touching the points at the vertices of the original drawing. Um, with this large resolution and large screen size, there's no flicker because flicker comes from dynamic refreshing of a display. And since this display is not dynamically refreshed, there's no flicker. So as long as power remains applied to the screen, it's just going to keep displaying the image that was drawn. So all of these things combine together to create uh, a killer terminal for CAD applications. Now in this period of the development of CAD, uh, 70s and early 80s, basically all the large companies like Boeing and Ford and Chrysler, they're all creating their own CAD applications in-house by writing their own software. Eventually, some of those uh, CAD applications get resold to other companies because you know, if you spend millions of dollars to develop this CAD application in-house, it's even though it's making you more productive, you'd still realize, hey, this application can be used by other companies as well, smaller companies that can't afford to develop their own CAD package. So a lot of the first generation of CAD packages start out as in-house proprietary applications for their specific needs of their specific manufacturers. And then some of the manufacturers realize, hey, we could sell this to other companies and make a little bit of money on the side too. After doing that, for a period of time, some of the people who worked in those companies realized, hey, we can just make money by making a CAD package and selling the CAD package. We don't, we don't have to work for Ford anymore. We can take what we learned at Ford about building CAD applications and go make our own CAD application that is specifically designed to be used by many customers and not just Ford. So the next generation of CAD applications come from people who um, had that idea and created CAD software companies all on their own. Some of them uh, stayed as a pure software company. Some of them decided that as they built their CAD applications and they needed more powerful graphical displays, they're going to create their own hardware to go along with their software. But the, um, the storage tube terminal is the thing that really kicks all of this off because it uh, has this high density display. It's cheap because it doesn't require dynamic refresh. It can be used in environments with low communication bandwidth to a host computer. And uh, the, the storage tube nature of the display means we don't have to spend money on electronics to refresh the display. So that's what makes the terminal cheap. 
it makes computer graphics affordable by a lot of academics and a lot of smaller companies, enables them to start doing uh, graphical software development um, outside of a huge uh, equipment expense. So it creates a whole market for graphical applications. Um, initially dominant in you know the automotive industry because they have a lot of requirements for mechanical CAD as well as as cars get more and more electrical devices in them they need electrical wiring diagrams and things like that those all need drawings to, to be able to specify all the information up front create a, a bill of materials for the parts that are used in the design hand that off to manufacturing to create tooling to create the tools that are used to make the parts that go into the car and so on and so on so it's a, many many layers of design are involved and at that point you need diagrams that can be communicated efficiently between the different parts of the company that are working on those different aspects of manufacturing and so as the products get more complicated the need for computer-based diagramming and uh, design becomes uh, moves to the forefront. It also ends up being used a lot in uh, GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems. That is the software market that services cartography, so map makers. And uh, this gets, uh, opens up the door for, you know, things like urban planning and a lot of government organizations have need for a lot of mapping. Uh, there's, you know, national mapping efforts, efforts through the United States Geological Survey that all gets turned down into data that eventually gets digitized and put on a computer all the way down to things like mapping out the boundaries of all the election precincts in a political district and so on. Everything has some connection to uh, a map in some way because um, everything's divided into some kind of administrative boundary, right? So all of those things need maps, and uh, doing all that on a, a computer is much more efficient than drawing all those maps out by hand. Now this product line, the 4010 uh, and the 4014, 4014 having a bigger tube, it's a little more expensive. It's got the circuitry is a little more fancy, um, but both of those remain uh, extremely dominant in computer graphics applications to the 70s and into the early 80s, and the reason for that is in order to have the competitor is a dynamically refreshed display, pixel-oriented display, or a vector-oriented display that's dynamic. A dynamic vector display has a disadvantage that it starts to flicker as the diagram gets more and more complicated because you have to draw more and more lines. You need to draw things at at least 30 hertz for it not to be a flickering display. So as the number of lines increases in your diagram for a, a vector display, you have to draw them faster and faster and faster, and this means more expensive electronics to deflect an electron beam in order to get it to draw that beam faster. So that it becomes impractical at a certain point. You either live with the flicker or you abandon vector displays, which uh, most high-end computer graphics uh, in the 70s and early 80s were vector-oriented displays, but they switch over to raster as memory gets cheaper. So for a raster display, you need to store everything, every pixel that's going to be drawn on the screen into some form of memory. And you need to actively refresh that at about 60 hertz. So you have to read the contents of that memory out every 60th of a second to drive the electron beam to draw the image on the display. That's what every 80s microcomputer does now, or did then, it still does now. And that didn't become cost effective until the 80s because of the cost of memory. So as memory comes down, particularly you switch from static RAM to DRAM, dynamic RAM, that brings down the cost of raster displays so that it, it, by the time you get into the mid 80s, a raster display becomes more economical. It was always possible, but it was just more expensive prior to that time. And once it gets cheap enough, then uh, that becomes the dominant form of graphic display for CAD applications. And that also gives you the advantage of color and selective erase, which you didn't have in the, with the storage tube. But that early period from late 60s through early 80s, is, uh, it's not that there weren't dynamically refreshed graphical displays or even raster-based displays. They were. There were. They were just very expensive. So for entering into the market from the low end, 
the storage tube was really the thing that let you get there. Um, now, the advantage of the storage tube wasn't just that it could be a terminal. In the mid-70s, Tektronix said, hey, we can take these uh, microcomputer chips, microprocessor chips, and we can build a whole system around the storage tube, and then we can sell that as a complete environment for an individual researcher, say a scientist or someone like that. So they created the 4051, which is uh, using a Motorola 6800 microprocessor, and it has a storage tube for the display, the standard kind of They'd already figured out at this point how to do, you know, the, the, the keyboard circuitry and the display drive circuitry and, and how to talk to another device. So if they just put a microcomputer inside the cabinet with a tape drive, now they have a complete system that can be used without needing the host computer at all. Um, and the way that they made this accessible to your average researcher is they had BASIC and ROM. So you power this thing on, and without even putting any tape or operating system into it, it's already ready for you to write programs in BASIC. Um, they commonly would ship this with a GPIB interface to talk to scientific instruments in a lab. So say a, like a digital volt multimeter or something like that. And remember, Tektronix is primarily a test and measurement company, so by having a GPIB interface on the 4051, they enable it, all their um, measurement devices to be used in conjunction with this little, it's a microcomputer basically, but it wasn't thought of in those terms. And that gives you the ability to run your experiment, get the measurements, and then plot the results in some kind of graphical form on the 4051. The 4051 was a popular product. The 6800, however, is not the fastest processor in the world. So um, oh, let's look, take a look at the 4051 here. You've got the tape drive. You've got um, function key controls that can be used to um, simplify you know, picking items from a menu. Um, because it has BASIC built into the machine, there's also a screen-oriented editor built into the machine driven with these custom function keys. Um, the, there's stop and run and pause commands for executing your, your basic programs. Uh, if you couple, couple buttons for tape control, like you know, rewind the tape, um, index the tape, or, you know, give me a, index being like give me a catalog of the files stored on the tape or advance you know, to the next file. Um, and the, the 4051, before we leave that, as I said, the 6800 is not the greatest processor in the world, but it is, it's a good processor. And they wanted to have a faster version of the 4051, so they built something they call the 4052, where Tektronix used bit slice processor parts to re-implement the 6800 in their own bit slice implementation. And that was about, I think it's somewhere between two and four times faster than the original 6800. So the 4052, is a 6800 compatible machine in terms of the software, but it's a completely different implementation using bit slice parts, uh, the AMD 2900 series bit slice parts. So if you've watched the original Battlestar Galactica series uh, from television, you've already seen Tektronix storage tubes in action. Every time they show a screen with computer graphics being drawn with green lines. Those are all Tektronix storage tube displays being rendered. Um, they used a lot of the 4051s. In the picture on the left there, you can see there's a 4051 in the background. So not only was it used to draw the graphics that you saw on the screen, the set pieces were populated with many Tektronix instruments. They were a major sponsor of that show. There's a, a lot of the crew in the command area, they're sitting in front of 4051 displays or maybe a 4014 display, depending on particular position. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see like lots of oscilloscopes kind of doing little goofy things in the background as they're mounted in the uh, instruments in the, in the walls. Um, so I mentioned the, uh, the 4052 bit slice followed on the 4051. Following the, the 4010 and the 4014, they had a series of terminals that were the 411X series of terminals. 
and these were still largely, uh, there was a, one model I believe was raster, but most of them were storage tube based. And here they got the idea that if um, we put a little microprocessor into that pedestal where the circuitry lives, what we can do is download the graphical image into local memory in the terminal from the host and then using the local microprocessor control we can redraw the image by just uh, panning, scaling, rotating and we can redraw that image from the local memory without having to retransmit the entire image down from the host because again the communication lines are very slow so the idea that once I get my diagram into the terminal now I can pan and zoom around on that diagram to see detail. I can rotate it around, I could scale it, and it could do all that without having to retransmit the entire diagram from the host. So the 411X series is basically that addition to the terminal uh, line that gives you the ability to locally um, change the, your view of a diagram once you've got it loaded into the terminal. Um, they, as the raster cost of uh, memory came down and raster displays became more feasible. They switched to raster-oriented displays and again these had uh, microprocessors in them at this point in the mid 80s and that they had they retained that same functionality of being able to download the diagram into the terminal and then for local viewing you could you know rotate translate scale and we're still in the era of an, uh, low bandwidth communications even in the mid 80s, you know, a 1200 baud line would have been, you know, typical, you know, maybe 300 baud, depending on your location and what your phone company was going to let you run or how noisy your phone lines were. So uh, the idea of locate, loading the uh, diagram into the terminal for local manipulation and display was still something that was important, even though they'd switched to raster. Um, now, they would eventually take everything they'd learned about making these serial terminals and make network oriented terminals that would use the X window system to display uh, what we think of as a modern GUI. And um, there's a brief kind of window of opportunity there for X terminals in starting in the, the late 80s and going into maybe the late 90s, about a 10 year window with the kind of peaking in the around the 93, 94 timeframe. Uh, Tektronix made products for that too. Uh, they were not the only person to do X terminals, it was, it was a lot more competition at this point, um, but they did have uh, entries into that market. Now, as Tektronix evolved as a company, their success of their um, graphics terminals and their graphics products kind of grew into this huge division of the company and they branched out into a bunch of other things like they were making not just oscilloscope style test and measurement products, but a lot of digital test and measurement products for things like chip production and for they were making uh, CAD systems for IC design and they're, they're going in so many different areas that it kind of diffused the focus of the company and uh, that's typically not sustainable by a company unless all of those markets are growing at the same rate. So as the competition heated up in the graphics space with companies that are just doing graphics. In the mid 80s, graphics workstations start showing up from um, Sun, HP, uh, SGI in the later 80s, and DEC, you know, all these companies that are focused on computers and not doing all this test and measurement stuff, they start making graphical oriented workstations and start eating into the graphics market that was you know, kind of Tektronix just kind of lucked into it with their storage tube. And that resulted in a lot of competition and th they started losing their dominance in the graphics market. So at a certain point, uh, they just said, you know, hey, we can't do everything. We're gonna uh, focus back on test and measurement, was the, which is the core of what the, the company knows how to do. So Tektronix really doesn't make any graphics stuff anymore at all. They just make the, they they've just refocused back on their core test and measurement business, but they made so many of these um, raster and storage tube terminals, and just plain storage tube displays that they're still around. Um, they're 
I, I can tell you if you're trying to buy one on eBay, you better get your wallet out because they're highly sought after. A lot of people look for these. They're big, they're heavy, they require freight shipping. You can't put them in a box. So if you're looking for to collect something like that, you're, you're keep an eye out for, if you're in the Chicago area, you probably have a better chance of finding one locally than you have a chance of, uh, you know, at least an affordable one locally than you're gonna find on a place like eBay. But they, um, being relatively simple devices they're, and being small scale integration parts, they're uh, relatively stable in terms of their, their function. They're, if they do break, they're easy to repair. The full service manuals are online. Uh, you can read all about the design. They got a great theory, you know, from the stuff from the 70s has huge theories of operations section in their service manual so you can learn how everything works. Um, they are fun devices, but compared to a modern graphics device, they, they are slow, they, they are monochrome. Even if you have them on a fast communication line, 9600 baud is about as most that they can handle. But even then, it still takes a while to draw a complicated drawing on screen. But it is a very different experience from sitting at any kind of raster device, and, and it's a fun time. Um, and if you are a Linux user and you use Xterm, you may not realize it, but hiding in your Xterm is a Tektronix 4010 emulator. And it's buried in the menu when it says switch to tech mode. That's what it's doing when you switch to tech mode is you're switching to a Tektronix 4010 emulator that's built into Xterm and it's been hiding in there all these years. Maybe you didn't even know that you had it. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Question? So going back to earlier when you were talking about the basics of uh, a storage a storage tube, is it affected by burn-in in the same way as a dynamically refreshed tube? And if so, does that affect the memory storage as much as it would just graphics? Well, with, with a dynamic uh, refresh display, the tube doesn't store anything. It, I mean, the the, phos the image stays on the phosphor uh, for as long as it'll, you know, uh, when you when you illuminate a phosphor, it, it's it illuminated, and then the illumination decays away depending on the chemical characteristics of the phosphor. However, it doesn't it doesn't stay indefinitely. So with a dynamically refreshed display, there has to be some memory somewhere that represents the the image it's being drawn, and it has to be constantly transmitted to the tube over and over and over. With a storage tube, you it's more like an etch-a-sketch. So you write into it, and then as long as a constant voltage is applied to the tube, it just stays there. It stays visible. So there's no need to, you, you can generate the image dynamically from a piece of software, and even the software that's creating the image doesn't need to remember what it's generated. It'll, be, it'll literally be remembered by the tube. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, you said that this was used on the set of uh, Battlestar Galactica. Would this also have been the same thing used for the uh, Death Star plans in the first Star Wars, like the wireframe one? So in VCF 2019, a guy came and explained everything that was done with the uh, all that uh, wireframe drawing in the Star Wars movie. That was a dynamic refresh display system. Uh, where the uh, there's a piece of display memory that has all the vertices and uh, uh, of the endpoints of the lines that are to be drawn, and there's a, a dedicated processor that constantly cycles through that memory, driving the display. Um, I believe that talk is on the YouTube channel. It's in-depth explanation of the hardware that did that uh, image generation, but that was a dynamic refresh vector display. Yeah, if you go to the VCF Midwest uh, YouTube channel, there's a whole video explaining how they did it. <coughs> All right, well, if there are no other questions, thanks very much, Richard. Thank you.